For better or worse, since the dawn of time, our bodies' minds have been constantly and autonomously self-optimizing. Unless you're our sister Elishka. Jesus Christ. She looks like her mother if she got sledgehammered and an orc decided to put her back together again, like Humpty Dumpty. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that at the deepest core of our genetic code, we are constantly changing and evolving. Similarly to the unconscious and passive development of our species, we too as people consider the optimal path for development. Parents and medical professionals world over asking the question, how do I raise a family? Well, I hope you're seated because I have the answer for you. And it's not nature and nurture, that's for sure. Unless, by nature and nurture you mean, confining Schlorb to a castle with 200 other soldiers to better learn the art of stewardship. 200 strangers, who she now has power over, placed there with no democratic process, without any other family. No formal training in leadership. She is forced to just wing it so that we can level up her stewardship. Because right now she is useless. The soldiers, they, they know. They know they've become expendable. To be used as training for her. They know that when Daddy Glauben leaves the castle, taking his men with him, she is there alone. Alone, with the 200 men in the barracks outside. Are they disgruntled? Well, that depends. Does our stewardship level 1 governess remember to give them their daily grain? To keep their loyalty up? Well, loyalty is looking low. Does a loving father do this? I think not. But it will be the optimal path for development, which is more than we can say Elishka got. Ugh. Does a loving father force a teenage son into an army at a young age? In a perfect world, a loving father would place his son in a castle with books and a tutor, so that he may learn from afar the intricacies of battle, formations, strategy, to read and have a basic education. But this is not a perfect world, and that's not the kind of father I am. This is about development. Would a loving father place his son in the vanguard so that he either sheds or draws first blood in every single battle we partake in? No. No, I don't think a loving father would. <laughs> Perhaps I treated you too harshly. We clad Glubadorp in the heaviest armor possible. We do not allow him a horse mount. We hand him nothing but a two-handed axe and a shield. But best guest, you say? He can't use a shield if he only has a two-handed weapon. It's useless. Silence. Contradiction is a valuable lesson to be taught to the sun. He must learn that with light comes dark. With warmth comes cold. Yes, you see, with victories come defeats. With beauty also exists abomination. This is the philosophical teaching he must acknowledge. If he is to ascend from sun to warrior, he must learn that there is either life or death. That and I need to level up as two-handed because I think it would be cool to have a barbarian type character in the family. We've set up a few workshops in southern territory now, so fortunately we are no longer destitute. But we are being hammered by a war on three fronts with some very aggressive foes. Vlandia, Sturgia, and the Asarai. And because our assets are tied up with the Southern Empire, I figure it's in our best interest to get involved. I decide to focus on the Asarai first, seeing as they are the weakest of the three foes. Vlandia is probably too far away to make an impact, and Sturgia have had on and off wars with the Southern Empire for a while now, with little progress on either front, so I'm not terribly concerned about them. But for the Asarai, we had previously fought them and took Husen Fulk? <laughs> Husen Fulk? Though it was once their city, now it would be our frontline capital, as we make a push around their coastal cities. There's just one problem. I don't like sand. I mean, I don't hate it, but just being here gives us a slew of debuffs. Such as slowed movement speed on the overworld. The fact that the majority of my strategy in the game so far has been to use a very structured infantry, which are easily countered by the Asarai mounted Mameluke soldiers. And it's, and it's coarse and rough and gets everywhere. But this isn't about me anymore. It's about the children. And with me, I bring the second-born Glubadorp. There's no better way to raise a son than to force him into your army at a young age. Independence is a virtue. He, he'll, he, I have faith you'll get there someday. Against the Asarai, we face some unique challenges. 
Where we had previously fought against the Northern and Western Empires, we became familiar with their fighting style, which was very similar to our own. The Empire Kingdoms fight with very structured shapes, distinct cavalry formations, on powerful Imperial horses that have a lot of HP. And my successes against them came down to my familiarity with their troops, because they all recruit from the same archetype of warriors that our own Empire recruits from. In the end, fighting them I had three rules. Make sure my frontline infantry were well shielded enough to stand up to their cavalry. Give my infantry some covering fire with a row of archers in the back lines. But usually even if these two rules are followed, the plan fails unless I have more or adequate cavalry to compete with theirs. Basically, fighting the empires was horseback competition. If you could save your infantry from their cavalry, then you can open up and charge the enemy. But with the Asurai, this... <laughs> this doesn't work. Their entire strategy is chaos. It's almost impossible to adapt from one to the other without experience like I did. I mean, I could send Glubidorp first, which I did always, but in this case it was a lost cause. <coughs> so we looked to Schlorb's enormous forehead for our inspiration. Kill them, Dad. <laughs> kill, kill them all. I mean, execution is the simplest solution to the problem. But I'd learned some valuable lessons as I'd executed the nobles of the Northern and Western Empires. And that was... It made everyone hate me. And I mean, everyone. It took a massive amount of effort to even get my own faction to like me again. Basically, in my rage and headsman-induced frenzy, I accidentally executed many of my nobles' friends. It turns out that even in war, love can bloom on the battlefield. That is, until this man-goblin arrives and starts to kill everything he captures. So for me, that's a lesson learned. I repaired this broken trust with my fellow nobles with hours and hours of street sweeping. And by street sweeping, I mean I fought gangs of thugs over and over again. Who'd have thought you could kill a man's friends? But if you also kill a man's enemies, then they cancel each other out. Now they like me again. And let it be known that my commitment to the cause was unwavering. I brought only my most trusted soldiers. Even Dabana, who at the time was pregnant with our third child. Duba Denshin Dorben Donzelblob. All in the name of being liked more. She would repeatedly get beaten to near death in the streets. Duba Denshin Dorben Donzelblob turned out uh, turned out okay, I guess, all things considered. But yeah, executing the Asurai was probably out of the question, lest we repeat our mistake. I switched out my slow but tanky Imperial horse for the more nimble but fragile Asurai horse. If I was going to take over the Sands, then I was going to have to become the Sands, which is good enough considering the Asurai were born in it, molded by it. I switched my bow for throwing javelins, switched my two-handed sword for the longest spear I could find, upgraded my armor, and started to recruit from the Asurai villages. I needed to understand my enemy to overcome them. And if my army is made up of their own troops, then that is the best way I can learn about them. Glubadop, take notes. You, you're not gonna- you're not gonna get a horse though. These experiences will make you tougher. <laughs> Just trust in me, blockhead. The campaign against the Asurai is a slow burn. The Southern Empire being preoccupied with multiple wars on the North and West mean there's little remaining for me to recruit from in our efforts in the South. We're a, we're a candle burning at two ends, so to speak. I do what I can to progress the war. And by do what I can, what I mean is start every battle by sending Glubadorp in first, as usual. It works some of the time, all of the time. And on the topic of time, that's what I realized this war would come down to. Dealing with the chaos that is the Asurai war machine is an absolute disaster at worst, and a slog at best. At least until my strategy clicks. I found with the Asurai that if I set up a significant number of archers behind a shield wall and allow the Asurai to approach, they would cluster up and become pincushions. Essentially, the Asurai chaos had become predictable to me. I've learned that the only way to stop the chaos was to control it. This strategy fortunately worked regardless of the amount of cavalry I myself had. And what cavalry I do have, I'll just command to follow me and then flank their back line while the army does the rest. Though this works out in the battles, they just keep coming. Hassan Falk has become a playground for invasion. Unfortunately, the city is becoming irreparably damaged by the Asurai advances. So I think it's time to stop being the nice guy. If the Southern Empire will not help me, if they will not part from their quarrels to the north, the nobles simping for their Empress Regea, and so on, we descend into madness. With each stroke of the axe, an Asurai noble dies. With each execution, <laughs> with each execution, their army grows weaker. The clans grow thinner. Their advances crawl to a halt. Glauben Waldemann's ghastly head becomes the phantom in their nightmares. How terrifying. Now that I've figured out what makes them tick, their advances become trivial. The road to their domination is paved with silk. A red carpet for the Ball Man clan. We take Tamina Castle. And to follow was a great battle at the gates of Raji. Razi? Eventually so too does Hubia fall. 
the battle weighing heavily on Glauben's fragile mind. Then south to the nearby castle. Though initially I'm granted the cities, because I've been executing so many people, Regea eventually dislikes me and then starts giving the castles to her other simps. But is her ire justified? Perhaps I execute her friends. But were they really her friends if they wage war against her? Regea, Globin is your only friend. Just Globin. Our crusade ends with the siege of Iarchus. This is the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. The Asarai ask for peace and in return also beg for forgiveness. Sources close to the Empress tell me that their most affluent nobles reach out in desperation, that she call off their bloodthirsty 449 war goblin. They ask that he be shut back in his cage and confined to the castle basement once again. Their mistake here, however, is that this confuses Regea because she is incredibly stupid. These instructions are unclear. And she decides to marry Nozon instead. Now, as far as I'm concerned, and I know he's my brother in the game, but I would consider this a fate worse than death. After all, her bloodline are of royals. She looks pretty, I guess. Is fairly successful. And now she is bound not only to our outback country hick ballman clan, but to the very dregs of it. Nozon is truly the bottom of the barrel. And by bottom of the barrel, I mean the grime right in there. I couldn't have scraped Nozon out if I had a spatula made out of vibranium. Some, th <laughs> some things are just not meant to be. Yeah, anyway, congratulations, I guess. Now, as far as raising children goes, an education of basically nothing but war is done in wonders. Schlorb absorbs knowledge. And knowledge is power. Glubadorp surprisingly has grown even larger and more manly looking. His constant and repeated defeats in the battlefield has put hair on his chest. But he can't mathematics. 10 looters versus 1 Glubadorp equals... 3. And he can't read either, or probably even string a sentence together. Blunt force trauma to the forehead will do that. Our third-born son has been intentionally neglected in this video because he is a disappointment. We lock him in the castle that we locked nose on in. This was to be our last cruel act. For what followed would be a series of philanthropic acts to repair the busted goodwill between Glob and Wolderman, the Executioner, and the Southern Empire. Some years have gone by. I'm currently knee-deep in the conflict with Sturgia, the Viking-like archetype in Bannerlord. Their approach to battle is far simpler than the Asarai. They hold up their shield and shield wall, basically. And then they do nothing else. The adaptation from Asarai to Sturgia was minor. I had to reduce the infantry in ranged and lean heavily into cavalry. Basically, so long as the Sturgians have an army of infantry to march towards, they will. And if they don't, they get confused and just stand there in a phalanx. Except the phalanx is bad because they don't use spears. However, in my strategy, range is really important. My cavalry is much more effective so long as the Sturgeon shields are pointing towards my ranged troops. And so long as arrows are fired at them, that's what they do leaving my cavalry to attack them in their backs. And this makes victory fairly easy. The battles at this point are becoming a blur. The snow on these maps burns my eyes. I guess that's the main downside. Visually, that's the biggest change. But perhaps bigger still is that now that Globen Wolderman is over 40 years of age, he's grown fatter. The moustache is my doing. It, it, just, it just suits him. He looks distinguished, yes, with his face brush. I had half a mind to lean heavily into making him look a bit more war-scarred and more badass, but I just I just didn't have the stomach to remove his bowl cut. It's become so ingrained in his character that I'd much rather he just looked like a washed-up sous chef. He looks ridiculous. Ashamed as he looks at his reflection. Reflection is very important in life. In Bannerlord, I took the easy route and executed our enemies. In theory, this makes their army smaller and thus our conquest easier. But much like in real life, taking the easy way out isn't always the way forward. A lot of people, such as motivational speakers, life coaches, and so on, will tell you to set goals and then teach yourself discipline to reach those goals. Some might even tell you that grinding out a result, whatever your ambitions, will make the victory at the end feel better. To work towards your goals, you have to take the first step, sure, but then you have to take another and then another. In hindsight, there are things perhaps that I could have done in my life that could have gone better had I set goals or taken that extra step. And I'm sure this goes for you, the viewers, too. Well, Life imitates art. I'd been so preoccupied with whether or not I could execute these nobles, and didn't stop to think if I should, and I had a good laugh doing it. I'd fail to think that upon defeat, there would be the very same fate waiting for us. I'm... I'm... <laughs> I'm in shock, really. I select my heir and life goes on. Literally. There was not a wink of indication that someone important had died. No memorial, no message, nothing. Jeez, that's cold. And I guess that's the coolest thing about Bannerlord. Particularly with the higher difficulty. You're not a protagonist in a video game. A superhero in a story. You're just Glauben.
Well, he lived how he died. A four foot nine man goblin. Thank you for watching. If you missed my last video, which was a channel update, then you'll have missed that I've set up a Discord server to keep in touch with you guys better. Basically a place to chat and have banter with you guys if you want. I think that could be really fun. Also, there's some fun clips in there already posted from a while back that was from when we were doing some Red Dead Online videos. So I hope to see you there. Link's in the description. I hope you have a lovely day. And until next time, see ya.